time to spare. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another uh, episode of Kids Seminar Series. Uh, today, we have the honor to host Professor Lucas Babadopoulos. Uh, he was just visiting, and luckily, we could have him here to present some of his work. Uh, professor Babadopoulos is an associate professor at the Federal University of Yara at Fortaleza in Brazil, and uh, he earned his bachelor's in civil engineering from UFC, two masters, uh, one in civil engineering and one in transportation infrastructure from Ecole Centrale de Nantes in France, and uh, the other from UFC. And he also got a PhD in uh, civil engineering from France. Um, his research interests include material characterization, rheology, um, damage, mechanics, and fatigue of different materials, especially bituminous materials. I know he's a, a friend of Professor Hajj. Professor Hajj, do, do you want to say something? Sure. Hey, come up. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Lama. Um, and again, I just really want to thank Lucas for being here and, and willing to give this uh, talk in the Kent seminar. Um, the light is very bright right there. So uh, again, thank you, Lucas, for, for coming here. I really appreciate it. And uh, for those who don't know, Lucas was one of uh, Henan's uh, professors in his uh, during his master's, uh, and uh, I think we're really lucky to have him and his experience because he's working on a lot of similar projects uh, related to materials for pavements, uh, both in rigid and flexible, and also the mechanistic empirical design. So we're excited to learn about what you have to share, and thanks so much. And thank uh, you for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. Please uh, stay uh, after the Ken seminar because we have a, a meet and greet session with uh, Professor Baba Dukulas. Please join me in, in welcoming Professor So again, uh, thank you very much for welcoming me uh, so wonderfully this morning and yesterday and now for the Ken seminar presentation. I'm very happy to be here. I really do think we have uh, many projects in common and maybe students to share and uh, experience to share. Uh, for me, for sure, it's a, it's really an opportunity to learn from you and discuss with you. Please stay a little bit after the presentation to discuss. Here, the idea is to present an overview of our lab. So I'm not presenting only things I do, uh, but just after that, so I, I'll, I'll try to pass less than 10 minutes talking about the lab and the, the ongoing projects in our lab and then focus on uh, one of my, the projects I'm most involved with, and it is on pavement design. So this is the idea for the presentation today, talking about that. I'm from Fortaleza, I don't know if you know, it's northeastern part of Brazil. I participate in different research groups, but they are count kind of inside the same cluster of laboratories in Brazil. So if you one day visit us, you for sure see some concrete uh, rheology and some asphalt biology talking together. We are about 10 professors working on that. I'm one of the youngest ones, so you're meeting one of the young professors. The most senior professor there, the director of the lab is George Suarez. Maybe you've read some papers by him. And let's try to, to talk about it. I don't have the changing. Oh, well, probably work. the first one, just click it. Yeah. And then it will work. Yep. Perfect. So this is the idea. I will get this seven of the projects that are going on in our lab amongst the 10 professors that are working there. And then I will just focus on pavement design. This is probably where we will discuss a little bit more technically and try to conclude a little bit with this stay here. So one of the projects that this one is, I am really involved in it. It's a part of our funding uh, with the state of Ceará. There's a, an agency that funds this kind of project. Uh, and it's called the Chief Scientist Program. So the idea is to get uh, faculty members really close to government problems. One of the problems we have is about transparency of pavement surveys. So our client, if you want to say that, our client in the government for now is the courts, the courts that need that want to get more information on how the surveys are made and if the surveys are made correctly and have good technical information and the correct ones compatible with what, what really is on the papers. So we develop a project with people from computer science programs in Brazil. So it's a partnership from the civil engineering, the transportation engineering, the computer science programs in Brazil to detect from images. And now we are using smartphone images. So there's a three-part app that you use, one for getting the images and the accelerations uh, together with GPS positioning system. 
Uh, and we try to categorize those images with, uh, it's not very common convolution network, uh, neural network uh, kind of technique. And we classify that image, this is the second part. So we get the images and the accelerations, we get the, the um, classification uh, by hand at first to train a CNN, and then to have a whole bunch of millions of images treated to categorize for the defects, either cracks or uh, patches or potholes and everything. We try to categorize those defects the same way a little bit that the official infrastructure agency does in order to compare them. So we do that for the courts. The government makes it uh, more traditionally. And the third, the third part of the project is to represent those results in heat maps. So this is the last part of it. We are working on this. We are three professors. It's a collaboration, as I said, some students working on that. This is the first project that may interest some of you uh, in the future. Uh, in the same uh, project with the, the state, Another thing is to control the quality of materials. So we are working on developing non-destructive testing that can be used during the construction. Again, our client is not the infrastructure responsible, it's more for parts. And we're trying to do that with, uh, we try to make it an expensive non-destructive -destruct tests. Of course, there are ultrasound techniques, other techniques that are, this is really interesting viscoelasticity analysis of wave propagation. I uh, will not get into the details for this project specifically. If one of you wants to talk about it, I will be happy to share information of it. And we also developed another kind of analysis, which is more suitable for linear viscoelastic materials than ultrasound techniques, which is mostly for elastic materials. Many reasons for that uh, we can discuss after, but this is part of a collaboration with, uh, with ETS in Canada, and also, we had students in NTPE in Lyon. Actually, the first developments of this kind of technology were in Lyon. And uh, nowadays, our partner is ETS. It's also a PhD from that. It's no good guy. This is why I'm in North America right now. I'm in a month period for this kind of project uh, with them at Montreal. Another kind of, kind of project that I'm working on, main funders are uh, steel company in Brazil and also uh, uh, funding agency for students, CMP. And we have also partners in France. It's for the development of geopolymers, who try to study how they behave in the fresh state with rheometers. We have either uh, rheometers for non-homogeneous or inhomogeneous materials and also common TSRs as you might have here. We use TA uh, D, uh, DSRs, it's a, uh, in AR2000 and also a DHR3. Um, and after the fresh state characterization, I don't know if you all are all acquainted with what geopolymer is. We try, we try to make concrete without any portal cement. We, we try to use eight waste. So it's about 95% of waste materials. For example, steel slags, this is why a steel company is a partner. And also fly ash. So usually, <clears throat> Uh, partners such as, I don't know, thermoelectric power plants, if you have any on your side, we can mix those sources of silicon, aluminum, and, and iron. And if you make that in very alka al alkaline solutions, these things, they polymerize. And they polymerize. It's not carbon, of course, but they also polymerize. They make a huge net of, of resistant material that, hybrid, that reacts uh, on time. And it gets from the fresh state, which seems like this. It's like a, if you like Marvel movies, it's like venom. It's very viscous, weird material. But it gets very, very resistant. We can make pastes up to 80, 90 megapascals of compressive strength. It's very impressive. So we, you, we can make concrete with it, but we may have some durability problems. We may have some fresh state difficulties to fabricate these materials, not only because of rheology, which is my main. Uh, study here, but also on health and security for, we're talking about very, very alkaline solutions, so it's dangerous. Uh, these are some of the, the technical challenges on it. We are studying the designers of this kind of paste with aggregates and also durability. In durability, of course, uh, you can imagine that if there's iron and various oxides, this can be very conductive material compared to common classical conventional concrete. So these are some of the 
challenges we are tackling on that subject. And another project we are working on, for now we only have funding for our students. We do not have any industrial partner for this one, but we're trying also to apply as everyone has seen around the world that some artificial intelligence techniques to predict material behavior. But this is only an example for uh, different kinds of concrete. This is ultra high performance concrete, high performance concrete. It works as expected. It's not different from any other applications. We do have some applications on that. More for concrete. Professor Suarez has a student also for asphalt concrete. So more results, more papers are coming on that. And we can discuss it afterwards. And another subject we study is fatigue, but for concrete. So we are trying to uh, establish a fat uh, fatigue analysis procedure, both the tests and how to interpret the results for concrete materials. Uh, of course, I'm not showing this for asphalt materials because it's in the other part of my presentation, which will be more, much more detailed. But this is really a challenge. Um, this kind of test in concrete is not always simple. There is much discussion on compression fatigue tests and tension fatigue tests. And then how do you mix it together? We're trying to do all kinds of compression, tension, and tension compression tests, fatigue tests, and, and uh, try to grasp how does this impact uh, the material behavior in terms of how fast it can break for a given fraction of compressive or traction tension resistance. Uh, we have students that have been to France for internships also in this in this subject, uh, in SIPCK, there's a student going to STP in the near future, and there's a student in TPE right now. This is another subject I like much. And also we do many projects on thermal analysis. I made them all together in the same, in the same uh, slide, but as you see, there's applications for concrete dams, so that concrete uh, foundation. So this is a foundation of, uh, Aero generation uh, power plant. And if you concrete it too fast, it gets hot. And if it gets hot, two problems can arise. Either your concrete can hydrate not very well with no wet transite formation. I don't know if you were acquainted on it. But if it doesn't form in early ages, it one day will form and will crack your structure. So you should avoid high temperatures. And also, you can have thermal cracking, like you have one part of the structure that uh dilates and then retracts uh of one bunch because it's uh, temperature increase was high if you have another part that didn't have the same temperature increase because you have a huge volume you can have a thermal crack in the first days so two kinds of cracking that we try to predict with thermal analysis uh we did have a student in Ecole Normale Superieure in this subject but we also study thermal analysis of for example mortars in facades like some facades, which are maybe darker, can have very high temperature amplitudes. And if they have very high temperature amplitudes, they can't fatigue. There's thermal fatigue of facade, facade mortars. And we're trying to address that also with thermal analysis. And in, this is a link with the fatigue of concrete analysis. If you do compressive, but take this in concrete, there's so much energy that you put in the material that the material gets hot. Few researchers are actually measuring how hot it can get, but it can get up to 90 degrees during the test. So you start the test at room temperature with your concrete. At the end, you're testing it at 95 degrees. And this is because there's a dissipative mechanism that gets your specimen hot. And you can calculate that as well. So we have many applications of thermal analysis. These are some of them. And this is a project that I'm not part of, so I'm not participating directly to this last one I'm, I'm presenting, but I felt it was important to talk about it. There are many projects right now in our lab for pollution, air quality, noise, urban canyons, and all these kinds of stuff, which are related to infrastructure. So the lab is a lab for infrastructure, but more and more projects with impact in society uh, in terms of pollution are, are there. So I took two of them, one project with a Samsung research partner and one with the chief scientist program, but for the environmental part, not the infrastructure part, and for evaluating the effects of infrastructure on noise and air pollution. 
one of these projects is also to develop uh, the hardware and software for smartphones uh, for people to use in great urban centers to know where to pass, for example, when you want to jog, avoiding noise and push. I'm not part of it, but I felt it was important to share with you this information. So this is for the overview, <laughs> took a little bit more than I expected uh, of the projects. And now I will focus on what I really am here for, which is pavement design. So I'll take longer on this. Uh, main funding is for, for students is our two main uh, Brazilian agencies. So students are funded mostly by campus in San Diego. And, but the client of this project is the National Authority for Infrastructure, which is a good thing. This is the first time in the last ever we had a project with the National Authority. Uh, I don't know if you know of, but until 2020, Petrobras was the most important research partner of all infrastructure labs in Brazil. And ours was not different. We developed many tools. Many of them are still used in, also in this kind of uh, new project uh, because people are the same. But nowadays, the ministry, the Department of Infrastructure inside the ministry has a project for research, training, and techno surveys of our roadways, which is very interesting. And in Fortaleza, we have four sub projects, and one of them is directly responsible for reviewing pavement design techniques. So we're actually getting it from the start. I say, I'm say i saying start, but it's tricky. And there's a context to be, to be given. The ministry five years ago bought a system for pavement design from a partner, a partner that was with Petrobras at some time, it, it still is. And they do have a software for pavement design uh, in its pavement mechan mechanistic empirical design, not so different for from what it's done in part of America, uh, but it was not that much discussed. So we have a real difficult time in getting it really used nationwide. And this is why it was so important to have really a new review, see what's done everywhere. And this is part of the reason I am here. It's to discuss and get all the feedback on, with professors and students, the, all the best ideas we can have to tailor the best pavement mechanical, mechanistical empirical design we can. And I'll try to share some ideas and then to get feedback from you afterwards. This also touches the chief scientist program in the state department, so Brazil, not federal state, uh, but for another application, which is uh, quality control of our structures. These are not the same, so it's mainly the need, but you'll see there are some, some things I will talk about this, mainly for FWD analysis, for example. So what, should, what is the philosophy of the mechanistic empirical design that we propose in our group? That it's hard to avoid this slide when talking about that. You probably see that every time you read about pavement design, usually we are interested in some mechanical response of your pavement and you try to relate that response that mechanical response of your pavement to any kind of number of repetitions of load that you can do without failing your pavement and if you look i put some quote marks everywhere and actually at this everywhere is the method we are we need to propose you have many kinds of calculations you can do and it can either, either be a transient linear viscoelastic elastic calculations or with damage. You can put anything you want here and it's still calculation. You can simplify or complexify your system if you want. And all the decisions are here. So how do you want to calculate? What will you simplify? What material properties are important for you? How will you predict how you calculate? How, what do you consider as failure in your system? This changes everything. And once you decided what you want to do, you need to calibrate your system. Otherwise, the mechanistic part won't give you what you observe in the field. And this is the most tricky part in pavement design. And what's unhappy for us is that once you decide what you want to do, you start observing. So let's say 
for you, failure is when 30% of your surface of your pavement is cracked. And let's say that you chose as material property, I don't know, uh, in indirect test or repetition road test. You start collecting data on it. So you observe your tracks, you observe your materials, you do that for 15 years. If you're lucky and you have unlimited mm, resources, maybe, maybe you have a uh, hundred test tracks. And when you finish that, you can calibrate your model. And if you're not happy with it, what do you do? You start over because your definitions are not the good ones. So it's very tricky. This is something I want you to keep in mind during all the presentation. This is why I started on it. Uh, so when you have done all that, all those steps, so you decided what your definition is, your materials, everything you observe, you need a transfer function. This is the why empirical is so important in mechanistic empirical design. We can't, we do not have theory enough to do mechanistic design yet. It's unavoidable, unavoidable. We want to observe material properties. Material properties are usually in volume. You need a sample. You need a sample great enough to consider it a characterization of point material. But in the field, what's a point material? What's, that doesn't even stand. I mean, in the field, you observe a surface property. If so, so we observe something which is of different nature. So it's not viable to have transfer functions if you want to, be, to do this kind of stuff. And so for this, we need calibration for local conditions. So much work on the laboratory and on the field. This is endless. Like this was already the discussion 70 years ago. It was rediscussed 30 years ago. We are discussing it now. 30 years from now, I can assure you, same problems. This is endless. What's the general approach? So you have material models and tests for calculating stresses and strain for characterizing your materials. And usually you need to decide that before starting. Once you do it, you build a structural model, you try to take into account the best you can. Here is where the simplification is. Your climates, your loadings, and then you propose some layers, layered structure, this is our pavement, we calculate everything well, up, to, up to some point, everything you calculate is mechanistic. It's just a calculation. It's simplified. It's, it's a model. It's not the reality. It's the best you can grasp out of the reality. And from this point on, you need something to relate to field. And the definition is rarely the same. Damage for us in the lab, it's not the same nature of variable as we observe in, in the field. So here are just two examples. You can have tens of this. Uh, for example, in, in our calculation, we can, for example, be interested in knowing how much of number of cycles already passed compared to what I can do to my material until it fails. I like to call it fatigue life consumption. Some people actually call it damage. For me damage mechanics point of view, this is not damage. Damage is a loss of cross-sectional area. So if you see Kashanov or Lemaitre, works or any classical damage mechanics author, damage is another thing. But this is a name we use in fields of pavements. But look how different can this be to a percentage of fatigue cracking in the field? What is a percentage of fatigue cracking in the field? Does this relate well to the number of cycles I already used of a material, we don't actually know. And this is where the transfer functions work. You need to observe it first and try to know how those very different variables relate after. And if you change any of those assumptions, everything's changed. So if someday you see a consultant that used, for example, shell transfer functions, and he decided not to use shell models, but another author's models, there's a funda fundamental problem there. Can you see it? Most people cannot. Most engineers cannot see the problem. And this is another reason why pavement design is so tricky. Once you developed it, you need to communicate them. Communicate all your system of calculations. This is why I call it system of pavement design. It's not actually a method or a model. 
you have many methods and models that are in bricks together to make your system work. If you change anything, everything should be redone from the start. And then, so just to end here, the idea, if your damage calculated for the field is too far from target, you redo the thing until it's good enough. So what should we, we be discussing is where do we want to be in the future? Like what challenges should we surpass? Is the problem the use of abacuses uh, from empirical design? Is this really the problem? I don't think so. I, I think the problem is our fundamental assumptions. What should we change now in order to have 10 years from now or 50 years from now, a good thing that we can discuss on for paving industry? Because I really feel that nowadays it's impossible to communicate. All of us, we have different ideas of what the system should be, and we cannot even discuss on them. It's not clear what changes of models, of materials, of structural models, of observation field. It's not clear what we should do. This needs to be discussed together. Academia, industry, all the organisms, the agencies, and us ourselves, we should be discussing that. What challenges should we surpass? Because if we came up with a system that needs a very fancy fatigue test that takes uh, two weeks to be done, do you really think it will be used, used in the field, in the industry? So there's a limit for how complex can be our models. Even people don't understand very well what we are doing. Ourselves, we don't understand very well with, with what we are doing. So we need to train more human resources on that. And we need to have a research agenda, agenda for that. So we need to recognize that the real phenomenon is too far away from us. We have many models. All of them are just idealizations. None of them are correct. They can be, some of them can be useful, but we need to be wise when choosing that because from that point on, we need to discuss with the same language. So there's no reason for one of us being using linear viscoelasticity and the other one, a very fancy damage model that no one can agree on or make the tests to explore the data. We need to choose how complex, how much of the phenomena we want to take. And don't forget, don't forget the message of the beginning. If we change anything, we need to redo everything. And the problem is that if you have more data, Assume that we have a system that we started calibrating. So we are getting that the data. Uh, if our system makes very bad assumptions, let's say we are making linear elastic calculation with uh, indirect tensile fatigue tests. This for me is a bad choice, but this is just an opinion. Some people would argue that having more data could have your model work even if it's a bad model. But this is not the case for any kind of field in science. Every induction part of science, every inductive research does not correct mistakes with more data. This is not true. So this is why we need to be wise when choosing how will us, or how will we characterize, characterize material. So we have two important axes of research. One on theoretical modeling and one on how to gather, organize, and use the field data. And maybe, maybe we'll have uh, useful, uh, useful models, useful systems for pavement design in the future. But I'm not even sure we are posing the good questions. And let's try to, to discuss a little bit more on that. We have two main problems, wheel tracking and tracking. We have many influencing variables. We are working on that so, right, for 100 years. We know a bunch of things, but how much of those information we really want to make into a pavement design system? For example, for tracking or for rutting, should we try to predict, sorry, the root depth, or should we just choose our materials? Sorry. <laughs> I imagine here in Illinois, Illinois, you just limit to a given empirical value of probably. I don't know, Hamburg wheel or something. In Brazil, for example, we decided to use flow numbers in the actual repeated load test, but it's the same idea. We limit, it, we limit 
some empirical value of some maybe empirical test, and we are happy with it. But an alternative would be to characterize a material and try to simulate from material properties and some assumptions to calculate how should the pavement behave. These are two completely different uh, strategies. We tried both of them in, in our group. There's a professor, a young professor, that's me, Jusceline Bastos, who works on that. It actually works pretty good if you follow very well controlled uh, track tests with simulators, for example, uh, great simulators. Uh, you can have very good estimations of the evolution. So for wheel tracking, we can good, we can do a good job. There are even many different models that you can use for doing that. They work pretty well. Like in Brazil, we use uh, NCSU uh, combined triaxial strip tests, the triaxial stress te strip tests, and it works pretty well for prediction. We also try to relate the empirical values for mixes, like for number. For example, with uh, information from the binders, that does not pretty well work for us, but it's maybe because we don't have very, very, very much of a variability of our binders. So it's hard to see the effect of the binder in the phone. But we try to do that. And even if this seems to work less for us, we actually decided to use full number as a limiting value. And this is what we are doing. So we target the value of low number. We ameliorate uh, granular interlocking and binder. And once you finish that, we don't try to predict anymore the behavior. This is what we are recommending. This is this actual decision with uh, the ministry. We have the calculation all implemented. We have the software. We have everything. It seems to work, but it's hard to communicate. So this is one of the reflections I will leave you to. There are many models. This is just for reference. So you can read these details afterwards. Some models will try to have a global characterization of your material, both for linear viscoelastic behavior and for plastic behavior. It's only one model for both things. For example, DBN model by uh, Peer works that way. And also there are models that will make it separately. One model for plastic behavior and one model for linear viscoelastic behavior completely separated. You, you do need completely different approaches. We chose that because it works simpler, actually, and because this considered confining while the other one did not, but it's up to the choice of the rheologist choosing the models. So this is for breathing. For fatigue damage and fracking, I feel we are in really more complex scenario. Things are much more far to start to work. Uh, this is my impression, at least. Uh, so here, it's just a reflection of different kinds of methods for cracking. So you have to take into account traffic, materials, structure, climate. Usually, and I think in some American states, it's still used. In Brazil, it's still the most important method, the CBR method, carbolic, California bearing ratio. You have an empirical value for each of your layers, and you have an abacus that says, okay, when it's those values for those traffic and those climate, it's okay or not. And you look to those abacuses and it's finished. Either you're okay or not. This is completely based on experience from six decades ago, decades ago, decades ago for different problems. At that time, it was not fatigue. So how, how would we is, expect to avoid fatigue with this kind of method. If at that time, fatigue was not a problem. It was actually permanent deformation of the granular materials. So there's no reason to expect that fatigue is solved. So of course, we needed to try to evolve to some kind of calculation for fatigue. Uh, there are many two-step approaches, very famous around the world. Like if you use a, any book, any handbook on pavement design, for example, one, you see, what some kind of times called two-step approach. You have the materials, you calculate uh, a mechanical response and you compare to some limiting value that you accept, either tested for your material or from experience. For example, Samuel Carpenter uh, suggested 70 micrometers per meter in an elastic calculation. Some people suggest 100. Any kind of anything you do, I call this the simplified mechanical, mechanistic empirical design strategies, which are fundamentally different from the 
next ones I will present, but let's try to look. We do stiffness tests. We have a numerical model. We make some kind of calculation that can be more or less different. If we do some kind of fatigue test, we can choose among many. The difference with mechanistic empirical this designs that I'm calling here ambitious is that these ones will try to predict something during time. We try to do performance description. Most famous in the world is FlexPay. There are many others. I, if you have approximately each great laboratory has its own method. Uh, in Brazil, we have the official mechanistic empirical method I, I cited before, uh, which uses indirect tensile tests and elastic calculations. And we have ours methods. These are three methods you currently in use in Brazil from universities. Uh, this one is used in Petrobras Center in partnership with the University of Rio. This one is developed by the University of Rio. And this one is us. So mm -hmm. once you see this sign, it's because it's us. Uh, tests can be the same. This is important. So you can have exactly the same test and have completely different methods, either limiting a value or trying to predict what happens in your paper. This is the main difference. But when you do this ambitious, ambitious mechanistic empirical approach, you'll need much more data because you need to calibrate what you calculate in the lab. And as you saw, it's a different kind of variable compared to what you actually observe in the field. This is not the same kind of variables. They are not of the same nature. We do, know, do not know much of them as a relationship. So we need much testing to have this relationship. And data is the most important part of it. Uh, how to organize, to, to collect them, and to share those data is in the core of having these ambitious mechanical, mechanistic empirical models to work. OK, so which of those can actually differentiate between materials. Of course, for empirical model, this is very hard. So it's hard to sell a better material for your uh, for, for an asphalt layer using empirical models. The other two, they can detect those differences depending on how you, cal how you calculate. So main difference for me is trying or not to predict something that is, that is very, very complex. We are trying in our lab to do the prediction Nowadays, we use uh, SBECD. It's uh, most of you probably read about it. It's not that we are 100% confident with it, but it's, it fits in a lab schedule for testing. I think this is the most important part of it. But if we have some theoretical problems, which we may find in the future, let's remember that we should come over from the start. But for now, we are using this. We use SVCD to calculate how much how many cycles we could apply at each point of the material, because in the pavement, so let's imagine this is the asphalt layer, and below it, you have all the rest of the pavement. And we have different strain values at each point. So theoretically, you could have this point ending the service at service life, and this point that did, didn't even start to be used. Uh, so we need to take that into account. So our problem is very non homogeneous And for now, we use that, but we for the materials. So for the materials, we get very complex model, but for the calculation of strains, we do not do that. This was our decision in order to have very fast calculation in the computer. So we, the only thing we do is that we take into account the traffic speed and the temperature in order to calculate the distribution of stress and strain. This is it. And I can say the trend at this point of the project, this is what we are doing. The trend now is that we get even simpler because this is already too much complicated for uh, pavement calibration. And this is why we are trying to get simpler. Other kinds of discussions we can have here, I won't take too much time here, is that depending on the kind of test that you choose, for example, French people like very much to do two point panning at this one. And ah, we're doing tension compression. Remember, for the mechanistic part of the thing, this will change everything. So, of course, when you observe the problems you have in the field, 
some function needs to correct those difference in order to get the same results in the field because the results in the field are the same independently of your model. The model is just you, it's not the material. The material behaves as it is, and the model is you trying to analyze the material. This is a very conceptual, important concept. So we try to add those things up and create axes, transformed axes, functions of the me mechanistic results that can agree together in the, in the fractured area. So if you don't change your axis, of course, results will be very different depending on how you decided to do your calculation. So calibration also needs to take that into account in the transfer functions to get all the curves to start to resemble something because otherwise you can't do prediction. Um, so this is what we use for now. We have a software that do many kinds of calculation, transient linear viscoelastic calculations. We can do dynamics. We can do many things, but for pavement design, we decided not to. We decided to simplify it at most. So we have an elastic axis symmetrical calculation, but we have the modulus of the asphalt layer that can change in depth depending on temperature. Let's say here it's very hot and here is less hot. You can have different modulus inside the, inside the asphalt layer. This is something we did not want to simplify because we do know it's too important. And so this is what we do, but it's a linear viscoelastic, a linear elastic calculation using an elastic modulus equivalent in temperature and frequency to the viscoelastic modulus. And we do fatigue damage using uh, VECD, if you want. So I will not get into the details. All of you probably saw that. It's kind of a trying to count damage with some equation. It's a, a law for damage that's exposed. So there are many assumptions that may not be true, but it's a model as any other. And we try to have a unique uh, curve between the damage or the integrity, which is one minus the damage from the mechanics perspective in, with respect to this damage counting, which is also called a damage state variable in the literature. I do not like that name. I prefer to refer to it as counting. And this way, every know, everyone knows that this is not actually completely mechanistic. Uh, and we have to add a failure criterion. So for example, we use GR and F. I won't take into the details. So we have many fatigue tests and we try to have a unique curve relating how much pseudo energy you get into it and how much cycles you can apply before failure. You have those two information, you can simulate fatigue and calculate what we do with that. We calculate a hollow curve for a constant strain amplitude. So for a given strain amplitude in a point in the pavement, I can get a number of cycles at failure. And this is what we do in, in capitalist did is the program you use with the law much work on that for pavement mechanic, for pavement design, for predicting wheel tracking and also fati uh, fatigue tracking. So this is the, the system, I won't get into the details, but we can calculate from the models we choose and from the data we gather during previous projects, uh, do, we do the pavement prediction, pavement performance prediction. This is for design. We also have, <coughs> sorry, we also have a back calculation procedure using also the same uh, finite element software. So the finite element software is also called by this back calculation uh, engine. And this one is part of the project with the state agency. So we try to evaluate the quality of the existing infrastructure. The next steps of those projects is of course, try to trying to integrate pre predictive models with real life decision-making. So, are we sure that making pavements more robust, so investing in better construction, are we sure that we have less money in the life cycle of our structures? This is the question that motivates this, that we are just starting. And I can say you for what we started, uh, so this is just the depiction of a predicted cracked crack area with the engine I just, just, just showed with Catrice During time, for two, two design alternatives. One that will require more maintenance and rehabilitation, and the other one that requires less. So if you can start comparing costs in a life cycle for different strategies. And I can say 
if we start using, uh, at least for the pavements we analyzed for now, it's just starting, this is for three months ago. Uh, for low traffic volume, not necessarily investing more in the construction will get you saving money. And this is very interesting. So we will let, always expect that it's it's cost less because you get less maintenance. But sometimes the maintenance is so cheap compared to the investment in the beginning that this can change. For high traffic volume, systematically, we found that you need to invest more in robust uh, payments. None of this can actually be applied with the current methods, the empirical methods. You, you can do this. You can't. You just can't. You need. We need to move for more uh, complex systems. So this is the conclusions. I'm sorry, I get almost ten minutes more than I should. Uh, as you saw, we are trying to complexify our lab. So we are getting more contacts with the costs, with pollution, uh, with climate, and everything. And we feel this was a good experience for us. So this is just a comment on the first part of the presentation. When it comes to pavement and E, as you see, this is very challenging. And we feel, I feel in our lab, we feel that we should discuss a lot more with international groups and also with Brazilian groups. We need to get in touch and to clarify that this kind of problem is too complex to be solved by one group. There are too many decisions to take, and those decisions have nationwide impacts. Impact. One of the possible impacts is what we have in Brazil right now. We have a model, a system for calculating for pavement design that we do not trust. And this is because nothing was decided together. So it's normal. Why should we trust the method if we know the method is too complex? And also that it do not systematically give gives reasonable results. So this is the point of our problem. We need to also start including costs in our analysis. Otherwise, sometimes we will spend too much constructing and not necessarily this will reduce costs of maintenance and rehabilitation. And maybe the main message I have is that all the data we need to have pavement mechanistic empirical design drives this field. We can only have good pavement design if we work on that not as a group one group or many groups. We need to work on that as nations and even internationally. We should have more data gathered in an organized manner with many partnerships, of course, with better theory, theory than we have today for calculation, but mainly we actually need data science. And when I say data science, I'm not talking about computer fancy science. I'm just talking about having good organized data for everyone to, good, to make good theory work because for now it's too hard. I hope this presentation motivates you to collaborate with us. I put here some of the names of the professors um, that were cited or whose projects were cited during the presentation. You can use this, contact them, contact me as you want. Thank you very much for inviting me here, for having me here for the Ken seminar and for the very good talks I had with many of the professors and students. Very glad to be here. Thank you for the attention. Do you have any questions in the room? Yes, sir. Professor, I was curious to know what the main distresses are in Brazil with moisture susceptibilities, more important than it is here, and how, how is that researched or tackled? Thank you for a question. Uh, indeed, moisture, moisture damage is one of the main problems we have. We try not to classify it as a distress by itself because we see it as an accelerator of the other distresses, permanent deformation and fracking. And particularly in Ceará, but in many of many parts of our tropical country, country, moisture damage is really a problem as in many other countries, like I know Silvia Caro in Colombia, she's very, very good research on that. Uh, we have that problem in many places. We have projects on moisture damage. And I know one of the professors here, George Lucas Jr., he finished his PhD two years ago on that subject. I was his co-advisor. We worked in, on that a lot, trying to find, for example, how chemistry of the aggregates impact that. How should we try to address that problem? Should we try to change the aggregates or to ameliorate the bitumen? And this is really, really important. But for a pavement in me, as you saw, 
This is one of the complexities that we need to think how to integrate. And for now, I have the feeling that it's easier to just say, okay, does this pass my level of quality or not as a material? And once it passes, we just do the rest of the pavement design based on fatigue and wheel track. This is what we do right now. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but yeah, I was also curious to know if, if there was one that was one particular distress as well, that was more prevalent in, in the country or at least in Puerto Rico. It depends a lot on the place in the country, but I, I would say it's either permanent deformation or fatigue cracking. These are by far, like we don't have much of thermal cracking, as you can imagine. Maybe here it's a very common, maybe thermal fatigue or cracking also, uh, which can exist in some parts of America. Uh, but it's mostly, I would say, it's quite equilibrated between, quite balanced between wheel tracking and fatigue. Yes, please. Professor, you talked about the heavy analysis, right? But like, how do you incorporate the climate of different locations? So are you trying to develop some EICM? Like, are you trying to get some EICM module or what you're trying to do? That's a good question. Thank you. Uh, like in pavement in, 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 uh, in America, you have a very good model. Like, uh, uh, this is probably the best part of pavement in, the, in America. Uh, we do not have that. We do not, we do not have a huge project for developing uh, climate model as you. What we have is just data of hydrology and temperature. And we try to use that to impact our material properties. So for now, all we do is to say, to divide the year in 36 parts in order to have 36 different conditions of temperature mainly. And our material model has a modulus that changes with temperature. This is what we do for now. This is the best we can do for now, but I agree with you. Having a, uh, an integrated climate model would pretty much impact the model, as you did in America. I think also like a function of depth as well, right? Yes. Uh, there are some models in the literature. We did not question them enough, I think, but we did use them uh, as a function of the air temperature and the time in the day, you can calculate the distribution of temperature inside your asphalt layers. We do that. We do that dividing the asphalt layers into three parts, and we take just in a simplified ma manner, one temperature for the first part, one temperature for the second part, and one temperature for the third part. So it's like we have three layers with different moduli in our pavement in each part of the year, 36 six parts. And then we integrate the consumption of fatigue life of all those parts of the year. Sorry, we have to end now, but maybe you can ask, uh your 